All right, so you guys have a final next week, so I figured we're going to do in lab today is we're just going to go over the final exam. Uh, I have three types of style techniques of going over this uh, final exam. One is we did a Jeopardy. The other one we're going to do a Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And the last one I took some frequently asked questions from last year's final exam and uh, brought them in here so you guys can see what the final exam is going to look like. I'll be posting on Cisco tonight one practice final. It'll be until tomorrow at midnight. And then the next day, Thursday, I'll be posting another version of that. I believe there are three practice finals on Cisco's website. So I'll be posting all three of them. Uh, the third one will be posted this weekend. All right, make sure you guys take them. Um, ask questions if you have any. Uh, the way we're going to do this, we're just going to go around the classroom. I will pick on Brian. Brian will pick your first question. And then after we work it out, we'll go to the next one. Okay, guys? So Brian, tell me which one you want. Your categories are up top, and then the difficulty, uh, quote unquote, are somewhere up on the board. So, yeah, troubles for a hundred. Nah, okay. call me Bob if you want. If a routing issue would occur in your inner network, what device should you uh, examine to isolate this error? So, which one would you look at first if you have a routing issue? It is a 100 level course, so don't let it uh, mislead you. What do you think, Brian? Are we like, all supposed to try to answer this, or just the person? Oh, I'll give him a chance, and if he passes, then it's up to the rest of the class to answer this. <laughs> Evan's over here itching at the bit <laughs> to answer it. No, I don't even know if I know that. <laughs> right. Don't overthink the question. If you're having a routing issue, what device will you look at? There you go. <laughs> it is a 100 level course. <laughs> so 100 points. All right, let's go back to the home. Ian. I think uh, commands for 100. Commands for 100. Do you like keeping score? <laughs> no. <laughs> You're getting nothing for it. Uh, what information can be gathered by using the command ipconfig? Yeah, so it's the host configuration. Uh, by the way, that command only works in DOS. Uh, if you try it in Linux or even iOS 10, you have to use the command if config. Yep, so interface config is what they're saying. Which is sort of smart because hopefully by now you realize your network interface card doesn't have to have an IP address. You could be using like Apple Talk or IPX or even IPv6, correct? So using IP command is sort of like very biased to the IP protocol, right. which is very common. All right, Evan. Cool. Um, I'll go with config for 200. Ah, he's bold. <laughs> Give him a hard time, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> I pick 100 <laughs> level question. A technician is asked to secure the privilege exec mode of a switch by requiring a password. Which type of password require the log? Oh, sorry, require this login and be considered the most secure. So you're trying to lock down the privilege exec mode. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it says switch, router, or whatever, as long as you realize you're locking down the privilege exec mode, and it's got to be the most, quote unquote, secure. Would you use like, enable secret? Enable secret would be the best one. Yep. Uh, which prompt would you issue this command from? In the, um, the Global configuration, yes. Yep. Brett. I'll do commands for 200. Commands for 200. What information could be gathered by using the command netstat? This is from chapter 4, transport layer. What did chapter 4 handle in the course? What was the transport layer all about? Segments. Segments, but we're still on Brett right now until he throws it up to the class. I encourage you guys use this command if you start noticing your internet connection is being sluggish or your computer is being sluggish. All right, I gave you the command net stat dash n, and I think the n just does it in numerical order. You can do net stat dash all, and that'll display a list of all what. Um, this way. All the. Uh, 
I wouldn't go that far as much as Brian. Uh, I was just going to say, you can type it into your computer. Yeah, and find out. Why don't you do that? Hold the window key, type in the letter R. Or sorry, hit the letter R, then type in CMD. Hit enter. And type in netstat and see what it gives you. And you can even do the dash N if you want it in numerical order. It doesn't matter. All the active connections. All the active what? Active connections. What are those called? <laughs> yeah, and you can actually see UDP connections as well. But yes, all the active connections. There you go. From your computer. That's what's important to know that these are all the different connections that you have going either out or coming into your computer. Michael. Troubles for two. Where am I at? A PC cannot connect to any remote website. Ping its default gateway or ping a printer that is fully functional on the local network segment. Which action will verify that the TCP slash IP stack is functioning correctly on this computer? Yep, the loopback, which is what address? That's 0 0.1. So you ping the loopback to test the protocol stack to see if it's functioning. Back to you, Brian. Troubles for three. Host A and B are unable to communicate with each other. What is the reason for this? So we have a diagram. Remember, do not make any assumptions. Since go deliberately threw you off because you might want to say, <coughs> well, that router should be a switch. And that's not the case. They wanted it this way. Um, the other thing I wanted to make point to you is on your final exam, it is multiple choice. Right now, I'm just testing your general knowledge going back out there and grabbing it. Like I said, I'm doing three different methods here. So uh, work with what you're given. So Brian, which, how are you going to accomplish this? Tell me, I'll do it up on the board so everybody else can see it. OK, so he wants to verify to see if they're on the same subnet. But be careful. Tell me what needs to be on the same subnet for them to work. Does host A and host B need to be on the same subnet using this lo logical topology? No, this router has three networks. It has this WAN. One network here, one network there. So host A and host B do not need to be on the same network. But what does need to be on the same network? Gateway. The gateway for each network, right? So this interface needs to be on the same network as that. So if I look at host A, the way I can verify that is that my IP address is 192.168.200.130 slash 26. That slash 26 is telling me put all your attention on the fourth octet, right guys? So let's take that 130 and convert it into decimal. It gives me a 128 and a dead marker. Let's see. A 128 with 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, right? And then my subnet mask is just 1, 1, followed by a couple of zeros because I have a slash 26 which I'm all good with because this is telling me my subnet host bits are to the right, subnet bits are to the left, correct? So I know this to be a host address, cool. Let's check out what the gateway address is. We have a dot 128, that's a one here and a zero there, then all zeros. What's wrong with the gateway address, Brian? What is the gateway address? When you have all zeros in the host part, So I assign, and this is a noob, uh, first time learning this stuff, typically they assign the, they try to assign the gateway, the network address, because they're thinking the routers represent a network, so they get the network address. No device gets a network address or a host address, right? Or sorry, broadcast address. <laughs> we good about that? And no two devices on the same network can have the same host address. So let's look at host B, 65. That's a... And it is a slash 26. So that's what 65 looks like in binary. Uh, let's see what the gateway address was. 64. So it looks like host B and host A was set up by the same noob, and that is they gave them both a network address, and that would not work. right? So the network address was given to the gateway, which is not feasible. 
The router cannot ping the route. Uh, sorry, the router cannot ping the router that is directly connected to the serial interface. What should the technician do? What the hell am I doing? You guys get to pick your own choice. <laughs> Where are we at, Ian? Um, I don't want that. <laughs> Luckily, do addressing for two hundred. Addressing for two hundred. What statement is true about layer three addresses? Are they physical addresses? What do I mean by physical addresses? They are literally burned into the ROM of a network interface card, so they're assigned by the manufacturer. B, are they used in routing decisions? Okay. What about C, are they only used on local networks? Sort of B and C sort of conflict with each other, right? So if you're going to do one or the other. Ooh, better get that memory checked out. Right. What about D? They are they uh, are altered each time a packet crosses a router. Do we change IP addresses as they pass from pack from router to router? Um, no. What does get changed from router to router or from host to host or device to device? The physical address, right? The frame. So B is the right choice. Yep. B was the correct choice. I just wanted to eliminate the other possibilities. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, you, uh, some cards will actually print out a label on there. The manufacturer will print out a label and put it on there. Uh, <laughs> the way you can find out your MAC address is go to DOS, type in IP config space forward slash all, and you'll get your physical address. So like, well, has it on the back end. Yep, yep. And the reason why is they use that MAC address is the SSID number. Evan. We'll for five Ooh, finally somebody. <laughs> What statement, uh, sorry, which subnet mask will allow for 1,020 hosts per subnet on the IP network 10.0.0.0? Let me erase this. What formula are you going to be using to answer that question? Well, I'm going to find um, 2 to the... 2 to some power, so 2 to the bits. They're going to be able to accommodate. So 2 raised to what power is going to be able to accommodate? Now, everybody's always going to the calculator. You should at least tell me what 2 raised to 8 is, because you won't be able to use this on the exam. Well, that's, uh, 256. 256, right? 2 raised to 8 is 256. So 2 raised to 9 is going to be what? 512, because you just doubled 256. So then 2 raised to 10 would be? 1024, which would be around the money. So 10 host bits? Mm -hmm. So it would be a Slash 22, or what are we going to do for the subnet mask? Because I didn't ask for prefix. Uh, 255. So this is what we have. We have a uh, 10, so we have 2 over here, and then, one, oh, sorry, two zeros over here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I have 10 zeros, right? Because that's what those 10 are representing. So this should be 252. Because this is three mi 255 minus 3 is just a shortcut to doing that. Because all 1s would give me 255, right? Yeah. And this is a 2 and this is a 1, so just invert them. So my subnet mass would be 255.255.255.252.0, right? I think I threw one extra 255s in there, but I tend to do that. Brett. Middle of the road kind of guy, huh? Yeah, I can't talk into the 400. What type of cable is shown here, and when would a technician use this cable? Straight through. Do you really need to look at the pin layout for these? Can you just look at the 568A and also see there's a 568 over here? <laughs> and if there's two five, if both ends have the same pin layout, then they are a. How would I make this a crossover? Exactly. Just swap the orange and the green, right? So make the three a green white, and make the six a green, and then make the one a green orange white, and make the two an orange, right? 
Those are the only colors you switch around. Everything else stays the same. So make one an A and the other one a B. All right, Michael. Can I talk to you in 500? Sure. Too late. You already got this one. <laughs> <laughs> Saw this one before. So the router cannot ping the, rou uh, the router that is directly connected to the serial interface. What's wrong? So this is what they've issued. So they typed in int s 0 slash 0 slash 0, typed in clock rate 56,000. By the way, you know this to be the DCE now, right? Because the clock rate's set up. Uh, then they typed in no shut, go down. They remembered everything except for what command did they forget to put in. In fact, the ping command actually needs that, which is what? You're missing an IP address. All right. Brian, can I talk in the troubles for 500? Yeah. All right, let's kill that column. Okay. Host C is able to ping the loopback, but is unable to communicate with host A and host B. What is likely the problem? So C cannot talk to A and B. C has an IAP address of 172.16.31.90 slash 27. I believe you're the first person to start this one off. And if you're having routing issues, what's the very first device you'd go to? Anytime you have problems like this, folks, escalate. I see a hub, nothing I can do about that, correct? Hubs are dummies. Whatever they get, they get to send out to everybody else, correct? So then I go up to my router. I look at my router and I'm given the following configuration information. Work with what you have. 172.16.31.93. This is the biggest complaint I have with these exams because they give you everything. In the real world, you have to be the detective and find out what to look for, knowing what commands to type and when to type them in there. Here they're saying, oh, well, if they gave you this information, it must be important, correct? So let's look at this. 172.16.31.93 slash 28. Any flags going off to you folks? Yeah, this is a slash 27, this is a slash 28. In order for them to calculate the network address correctly, they better have the same subnet mask. Yeah, so, so talk about the loopback thing, so the next thing you do. You run down to the trouble thing, and they did say the loopback was successful, so they're letting you know the protocol stack is correct. It's just they didn't configure the PC correctly. No, it allows for scalability. So then I can add other devices on here. Instead of, because remember, the router isn't going to be in that room. This could just be somebody's office. And, and this is going to be in the wiring closet, the telecom room. So this just might be a person's office. They, they like to add a lot to those diagrams just to make it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But everything else so that you can go out of your way. Ian, you're next. Can't talk into the 500? No, 500? You realize if you get the hard ones out here when you're on the exam, yeah. I mean, how do you measure difficulty? I just look at the exam questions, maybe put them at the 500 level. Who knows? Uh, when must a router serial interface be configured with a clock rate? The DCE. Yeah, and we've already discussed that. So you're seeing if I'm building those questions in here and there. Yeah, those are pricks. I'm not that way. I love you guys too much. I'm going to be straightforward. I've been honest with you guys all semester long. Why'd I change now? Evan. I'll go with 10 sigs for 500. Yeah, there we go. I like that. <laughs> Pansies. A technician wants to store a backup copy of the saved configuration on a TFTP server at 192.168.3.2 before yeah. <laughs> reloading the iOS. <laughs> what should the technician type? By the way, this question is on the exam. Um, copy. Uh, I like that. Copy start config. I like the copy start. Why did you say start and not run? Because you want it to copy the configuration upon startup. Not to run. Uh, well, it says 
the saved configuration. Oh, so that would be the one. Yeah, the and where is the startup configuration file stored at? In the, well, if you've saved it, it's in the non volatile Yeah, it has to be. It's got to be saved because it's not yeah. saved unless you do it, right? Mm -hmm. The startup is the saved configuration. And we just call it the startup because that's what they booted up from, right? Hence, it's got to be an NVRAM, non volatile. Good. So you did copy, start. What's the last part? Uh, it's like USB slash zero. No, wait, that was. You're, you're getting like really carried away there. You don't have to worry about USB, There's not in this one. Thing, wait, where, where are we going? PST. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, then you're just going to copy it to that server. So just type in TFTP at the end of the command? Okay. Yeah, no, maybe. The, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm <laughs> guessing the, uh, the uh, do it through the copy. Okay, if you're going to put the IP address at the end of the command, Stop and think about this for a second. Could there other services be running on this end device? Yeah. Like FTP or whatever the case may be. So you should be actually doing the TFTP to let them know that's the service you want to initiate. Okay. And then maybe you'd be greeted with a prompt that will ask for the IP address, okay. yeah. which is what will happen. Okay. So if you just type in copy startup dash config, I just do copy start because it's the only file that will be beginning with that. And then TFTP, then you'll be presented with a question, where is the TFTP server located at? Does it have to be a local IP address? Can it be a remote address? Yeah, as long as your router has connection to that site, then yes, absolutely. And then they're going to ask you for the name of it, and now you just call it R1 Start, if you will, because that's the name of the router that we're dealing with. All right. It is on the exam. It just might be asked slightly different. What are addresses? Hey, I talk you guys into that. There we go. Yeah, a question like this is on the exam. Maybe not asked this way. I always love these, these Cisco questions. What table accurately associates the RF, what does RFC stand for? Request for comments. That's how we've actually made the 802.11 feedback. So uh, the IEEE's created this huge journals upon journals for feedbacks from you guys. So request for comments, and this particular one, 1918, somebody said, wouldn't it be great if we had all private addresses for the LAN so that we can reuse some of these addresses over and over? And that's what this particular RFC 18, sorry, 1918 is all about. Do you really need to know that? No. Just asking you, what are the private IP addresses? Let's see if you guys can answer these. Brett, let's answer by, oh, process eliminations. What can we rule out? Can we rule out A? Why do you say yes? Because the server mask to 192. 192.16? You're saying that's not the correct subnet mask? All right, I like it. Because the private address, because what he's saying is in a class A, the private address is in this range, right? Like 1.2.3 in this octet is a private address, correct? I like that. Uh, so you rule this out because of this being a 255 there, correct? Like it. What else can you rule out? Can we rule out B? What do you guys think? Why do I hate B? Ironically, class B is wrong. Class B starts at 172.16, correct? So that rules out A and B now. What about C? Can we rule out C? Is this a class C private address, 192.168? This is a class B private, beginning, if you will. 192.16? This is a class A private. These look good so far. Does this represent a class C's? Subnet mask for a private address block? You ruled out that one for that same logic, so this one's good, using the same logic that you applied. What about this one? Well, this one's tricky. We're going to pause over that. What about this one? Does this look like a class A? Network part, 10. Host parts, second, third, fourth octet. This one's looking pretty sexy. Let's compare C to D. What makes C and D different? Well, right there, that 240 is wrong. Correct? I rule out D, B, and A, and I'm stuck with C. And then I have to worry about this 240 here? 
Remember, class B goes from 172.16.0.0 all the way up to 172.31.255.255, correct? 16 to 31, isn't that like 16 hosts away? Well, when you look at this one, four bits, 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 gives me 240. Four bits, two raised to four gives you? 16, 16 networks, right, for class B. So that's the subnet mask, that is correct. Did you have to know that two raised to four to answer this question? No, because you could have ruled it out with this one over here. Everybody's good with that? So B, or sorry, C would be the correct choice. Michael, OSI for 500, is that what you said? Let's see, all the 500 questions I told you, they're going to be on the exam. <laughs> we got about an hour left of class. We got two more reviews to go through. All right, I'll go for it, but it's totally fascinating. We'll laugh at you if you get it wrong. Oh. This question isn't on the exam. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it should be. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Any takes? What's OSI stand for? Wait, wait a minute. Is it on this one? See, there's four variations I can assign you guys. I, don't, I haven't decided which one I'm going to give you guys, whether it's the first, second, third, or the fourth. I think the first one it's on. But the fourth <laughs> one I don't think it's on. What do you think the O stands for? Describe the status of that door over there. Open. Open. Oh, right, right. System. Interconnected. Interconnected. All right, so it's just, why is it open? I wouldn't say you can do whatever you want with it, but it's not owned by any company. So it's free for any company to look at this model and play along nicely. Hence the interconnected. All these layers are interconnected together. So when you decide to build an interface card, you agree to make sure it's compliant with layer two. It's going to work with a driver. And that person who developed the driver is going to agree that it's going to understand layer three addressing, right? And it works its way up the stack. Okay? So system is just a set of rules. So it's an open set of rules that tell you how the layers connect together, how the communication process is upheld. Any takers for 500? Brian, which one do you want? Oh, sorry, for 400? Yeah, I think we should be focusing on the OSI because that's a big chunk of the class other than addressing. What type of network is maintained if a server takes no dedicated role in the network? That's like a classroom where there is no dedicated teacher. We all sit around in a circle. There we go. Peer to peer. <laughs> What's the other type of model that we have that we've learned? Chapter 3. What's that? Chapter 3. Chapter three. <laughs> <Is> a throwback. <laughs> Client server. Yep. And the difference between the two, as it's stated in this question, the server takes no dedicated role. And a client server, that's the only thing a server does, is hand out resources. Clients have to do what? They make the request, right? Okay. Uh, a question like that is on the exam, but it might be flipped. Client server model. Ian. A PC is communicating with another PC on a remote network. The two networks are connected by three routers. Which command will help to identify the path between the hosts? Oh, be careful now. Show IP route will only display the routing table of a particular router. That's not what they're asking here. They're asking you the path in which the packet will travel as it arrives to the other host. Trace route. Trace route. There you go. Or trace RT, depending on what. And by the way, you can run trace RT for, or sorry, trace route from the iOS, just like you can run the ping. Evan. OSI. 
OSI 300. Which OSI layer addressing is required to route packets between two networks? That question keeps on coming up and up and up. Uh, network, network layer or layer three, right? Yeah. Either way, they're interchanged. This leads to a really why good question. Why don't people just call them the network layer? Why do they refer to layer, layer three? three? It's not like it's you're so, saving so any breath by saying layer three. <laughs> network layer is. You want to know why? <laughs> because you look at the top and you notice there's seven layers, and you can say it's somewhere in the middle, like layer three. <laughs> right? Whereas knowing the names, like what is the first layer? What's the layer seven? Presentation. Application. That's what I'm Application. <laughs> presentation. <laughs> Session, transport, network, network data, link. data link, and physical. Where you can just say layer seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, but I think uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just I know the like transport and like the other ones <laughs> really well, but the ones above it, it's like better get to know them by yeah. Wednesday, right? All right, uh, Evan. Oh no, you did that one, right? I know. I'll do that. <laughs> Hot luck for 400. Nobody wants to finish off commands, a little lonely old 300. How many usable host addresses may be assigned when using 128.107.0.0 network address with a subnet mask of 255.255.248.0? Which information do you care most about, this or that? So that mask. Yeah, 248 and a zero. 248 looks like this. Right? It should be a 128 plus 64 is 192. Plus 32 gives me 224. Plus what? 16 gives me 240. Plus 8 gives me 248. Followed by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Zeros, correct? Now we're talking about range, usable host addresses. So I know that the very first address, and I'll draw this in red, has got to go between, I don't care what's over here. So I'm just going to put little X's because I can't change that, correct? But it's going to be all zeros to this point except for a one right there, correct? Did I give myself one too many zeros? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, good. And then it's going to go all the way up to all ones and a zero there, correct? Because all ones would be the broadcast address and all zeros would be the network address. So since I'm splitting the third octet, I got to look at the third octet. Luckily, they gave me all zeros, correct, in the third octet. So this would look like zeros here. So it better be 128.107.0.1 for the first usable. And then the last usable better be me converting this, so that's a 7, dot 254. Let's see how well we did. Oh, they're on this total usable. How many usable? Duh. Sorry, I gave you the usable range. Uh, made it more than... Uh, in fact, I think I gave you an exam question by accident. Uh, the way to get that one is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. <laughs> Oops. Consider it a freebie. I'll write that one down to study. <laughs> yeah. Got a little zealous there. Michael. <laughs> Don't worry, Ian. We got a couple of 100s left for you if you want those. <laughs> Which service is used when the NS lookup command is issued on the computer? And once again, you could probably just type that command in, go to DOS, type in NS lookup, followed by a question mark, if in doubt. Personally, I would just look at NS and realize that those two letters mean something, and I need to know what those are. Where else did we see two letters? Well, it was actually three letters, but it had the NS <coughs> in it. <coughs> it's 
especially when we're configuring our computers. I always told you guys not to bother with this because we're not going out on the internet or we're not using blank. Go to the network server. Network server, close. DNS. DNS. DNS, the domain name. So when you're looking up to convert a uh, domain name to an IP address, chapter three. Brian, stay away from the 100s. I don't want you to hurt Ian's feelings. <laughs> What happens when a host station receives a frame that contains its own MAC address in the destination? There you go. Remove the layer two information to reveal layer three to reveal the IP address. Very good. All right. Whoa, don't be changing my lifestyle around like that. I don't know what I'm going to do. What can the user do from the command prompt router config dash line? What type of interface will it configure? Which will be a virtual interface, yes. So VTY, very good. What else could it configure? <laughs> nice special cable. Aqua color. What is it? What? What? What interface? Console. Console. You got it. Uh, they say a physical, but it should be console or line interfaces. Yep. Yep. Virtual. Stop picking your nails and look at the screen, you would know. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> Evan, what's up? <laughs> um, uh, config for 300. Which two actions could be taken by a router if a specific match is not made to a router in this routing table? There's two. So a packet comes in, looks for the destination network address, or calculates the network network. So our destination network address looks at its routing table and has two choices. <laughs> if you get somebody's uh, mail in your mailbox and it's not addressed to you, so you could drop it. But what's the other thing could you do? If, especially if it's your mail, if your neighbor, if it's your neighbor's mail. Yeah, default route. So just pass it on. There you go. So default route or drop the packet. Those are the two. By the way, might be on the exam, might not be. So is that a server? Is that router just kind of like your when he throws it away instead of like? No, he's saving us from uh, network congestion because if those packets are roaming all around, which is the question I was going to get into, <coughs> what else will the router do as each packet is passed through it? What field will it reduce so that? Uh, when it reaches the zero, the message will self-destruct so we don't get time to live and the packet header is reduced. Uh, that is always a good thing because otherwise we'd have packets from 1980 still roaming around the internet, which would be dragging our bandwidth down. Right. So get it easier, guys. Which IPv4 address represents a valid host address for a subnet? This question is always a pain in the butt. Well, they're all slash 28s, right? So first thing I'm going to do is just set up this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Four ones. This is my slash 28. This is my subnet mask. We go with that. Next thing, out of all those octets, which one am I just going to be converting to decimal? Why can't it be C or D? Yeah. All right. The way you can tell that is the only thing you're looking at is the fourth octet, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at 32, a 32 is a 0, 0, a 1, then all zeros. So it can't be that one because that's a network address. But you look at 0, that's all zeros. And here's where the line's drawn. So that's a negative. So let's look at 79. A 79 is a 1 in the 64. Can't be a 1 in the 32, right? Can't be a 1 in there, but then it's all 1s afterwards. So that's a, uh, 
which we can't assign. Hence, 113, which would be B, correct? You guys see how I got that? How many times I've had to do all this binary crap? I'll bring paper for you guys. Yeah. So B is the answer. B in binary. Brett? We were just on you, Evan, right? I thought we were on you. Okay. Brett? I'll do an OSI layer for 200. Doesn't matter, does it really, guys? It's not like anybody's getting extra individual <laughs> credit here. <laughs> just figured to give somebody a choice. The model's being shown. You all you see is four layers TCP slash IP. <laughs> Final Jeopardy or bonus round. Um, what OSI layers represent the network access layer? Yeah, physical and data link. What uh, layers represent the application layer? Application, presentation, and session. There you go. So it's TCP slash IP model. We took it up to the next level. Michael, you're going to take the potluck for 200? Yeah. Yes, you do. <laughs> In a network design project, a network designer needs to select a device to provide collision-free connections to 40 hosts on the LAN. What type of intermediary device should we put up on this local area network? Collision-free. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a comedian. Way to screw it up for my students that are trying to memorize this on the... <laughs> <laughs> it is not a hub. We should all get our own back. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a hub, it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a local area network. Remember as you switch. <coughs> switch. <coughs> Brian, looks like everybody gets 100 level course class. Question. Which OSI layer does IP rely on to determine whether packets have been lost and to request retransmission? Networks are used to pass packets from router to router to get to its destination. In fact, it says, what does the IP rely on? Hence, if you tell me network, the IP is part of the network layer. So that should have been a given within the question, if you will. Transport. Transport. Yep. Ian? Take power. You can handle this the one. <laughs> what does... It's yeah, system. system. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, just system uh, software. There's, there's, there's like there's the iOS or the OSI uses the OS. Yep. So it's just system software for Cisco devices. So it's the Internet Network Operating System. <coughs> what is the effect of using the copy running config startup? That's your second time getting one of these commands. <laughs> Wait, why, are you, why would you be copying both and running together? Are you copying both or are you copying one from the other? So what is the effect of using copy running config to start up? Oh, you're copying the running config to the startup config. So you're basically saving your configuration, yeah. right? I'll pick that one for you. I know it was a hard choice. <laughs> a network technician is trying to determine the correct IP address configuration for the first host on the network with the given information. 192.168, sorry, 100.30. What can we tell? What, what are we going to do here? We want the first IP address. Well, we got the submit mask, 111, right, slash 28. Now we just need to do uh, what? Let's look at that 30 and see what it looks like in binary. What does 30 look like in binary? Correct. That's 16 in there. 24, 28, 30. We're good. So this is where the line's drawn. We know all ones would give me the broadcast address. Mm -hmm. So all zeros would give me 
the network address. So the first usable would look like this, which would be what, 17? Because 16 plus 1. And that would go all the way up to this one, but 30 is being used, so 29 would be the last usable. The next, you know, because I believe we got them all. What's that? <laughs> That's another one. We'll get there. <laughs> oh, where is it at? Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys buy your lottery ticket last week? I know you guys <laughs> think. <laughs> you can't? No. Huh. What? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. So I've been corrupting a miner all this time. That's better. <laughs> what does IP rely on to assure reliability? Anybody want to take it? We'll make these open up. Ryan. TCP, absolutely. Uh, nothing that's unreliable. Uh, yeah, but the question is, it's got to rely on something because it's unreliable. Uh, layer 3 ICMP. Um, hmm, ICMP, what was that used for? What, what protocol that was? They gave us the ping command. Uh, UDP, well, that's the counter to TCP, so either it's going to be A or C. So TCP is what gives us reliable transmission. Love it. What does TCP use to reliably transfer data? How do they accomplish reliability? What's that? It's whoa, 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 wait a minute. What does TCP use to reliably transfer data? Yeah, sure. Who do you want to call? <laughs> Ouch. He was just kidding. <laughs> It is C, yeah. Biggest thing is sequence numbers and acknowledgments. Acknowledgments are letting you know that what it did receive or what it expects to receive next, right? That was expectational acknowledgment. What does hierarchical IPv4 addressing provide? Thirty-two bit host addresses. Remember, it's a thirty-two bit system. We can rule out A because that's what. MAC addresses. Uh, what about D? Chapter 5 stuff. It's like RIP. We haven't even learned any of that stuff, really. Uh, what about C? At least one address per person. You guys have smartphone, tablets, laptop, Xbox, PlayStation. Yeah, so you're getting the idea that no two devices can have the same IP address, right? So hence, no person can be given an IP address. Maybe a network address but not an IP address. All right, so B would be the choice. It's a 32-bit unique host address. What is a characteristic of CSMA slash CD? See, multiple devices can transmit simultaneously. That's true, but explain why it's not A. Now, be careful, though. I want to rule out C in a minute, but that's why I'm asking you to explain A. All devices listen and can hear all communication. And pull the audience. How many people think it's A? How many people think it's B? We can rule out B because we're talking about CSMA slash CD, which ring topology uses tokens, so that's totally against each other. You don't have any collisions when you use tokens. It's like those with the microphones allowed to talk. What about D? A device must have priority to, in the queue to transmit. It's QoS. So we're stuck between A and C. And CSMA slash CD. Devices are not allowed to transmit simultaneously. Because if they do, they're going to get collisions. Because CSMA stands for carrier sense, multiple access. So you have this common medium with multiple different devices that are going to be accessing it, correct? In order for them to actually send data, they have to check to see if there's anything on the wire. If there's nothing on the wire, they're allowed to transmit. 
Exactly, because multiple devices are not allowed to transmit simultaneously. And point to point, you're allowed to, because one's sending, the other one's receiving. But in CSMA, you're not allowed to. So to me, I guess A would be the one, because when you are transmitting, aren't they listening for that carrier? So that means they can hear everybody and what they're sending, if you will. They choose not to listen. Why? Why would they choose not to listen? Because their MAC address does not match the frame MAC address, correct? Hence, they just choose to throw it away. Exactly, unless you change the rules. Your company is using 178.15.64.1 all the way up to 95.254 for host addresses. What's the network address and the subnet mask to identify this? Guess what you get to do again? That's right. But this time you're not given the subnet mask. So in order for me to accomplish this, I'm going to take the uh, octets that ma d are differ, right? So 78 and 78 are the same, 15 and 15 are the same, but 64 and 95 are not. So let me convert the 64 into <coughs> binary. I get a 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then 1, I get a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. My output limit is 95. 95 looks like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Because I know 32 and 64 would give me 96. So the number right before 96 is 95. And I know 254 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There's my complete range. Everybody's good about that? Start on the left, you work your way over to the far right until you find pairs that are, are binary pairs that are not matching. Zero and zero match, right? Go to the next one. One and one are the same, correct? Go to the next one. Zero and zero are the same, correct? Go to the next one. Zero and one are not the same. I draw my line. Why must these be the same? They're the subnet, right? They're the subnet address. So my subnet mask is all this, then. Correct? So what is my network address? My network address must be 64.0. So I look for 64.0s. So it looks like it's between B and D. Now I have a slash 18 or a slash 19. 17, 18, 19, right? Because this is the third octet. So my choice would be D. Most of the problems we have done so far is me going back to binary. Most of your problems on the final exam is going to be addressing plus a little OSI stuff. What is the data link layer responsible? Ironically, another OSI question. <laughs> You'll be doing that tomorrow for your final lab, if, that's, if that counts. So what's the responsibility for the data link layer? C? Yeah. Control media access for placement of frames onto the media. It's the only time we ever talked about that was when we were in, what, chapter 7? What is true about ARP? I believe this exam is on your sorry, this question is on your exam or some variation of it. Can we rule out A? ARP's not designed to find the destination IP address, correct? Uh, what about C? ARP tables are stored in NVRAM. What is the only thing we've learned that was stored in NVRAM? Startup. ARP is actually stored in RAM. So if you want to restart your computer, you'll lose your ARP table. And what is the ARP table used for? mapping IP addresses to physical addresses, correct? That's why we don't want to store them in NVRAM because logical addresses can change all the time. So what about B or D? It uses proxy MAC address for source and destination during transit between routes. What do we mean by proxy? What's your definition of a proxy? If I say I'm going to have somebody vote for me because I can't be there to vote, we would call that a proxy voter, correct? So it's somebody that's representing you that is not you, correct? But they're going to sort of vote the way you wanted to. So they're going to act like you. Is that OK? 
So when did that ever happen? When I wanted to communicate with a device outside my network, when I went to go reframe that packet, so here I am a host, I am the sender, and I want to talk to somebody outside my network, was the very first thing I had to do before I can build the frame. I had to determine whether or not this packet belongs to my network or it's destined to go outside my network, correct? So I found the destination network address and said, oh, this is not the same network address that I have. Hence, what MAC address do I put in the frame to be able to send the packet out? The, the gateways, the router. But is that router the actual destination device, the final destination device? No. So isn't that router sort of acting like a proxy? To get to there, you have to go through me. Almost like I know a friend who knows a friend who knows a friend. So you're sort of acting as a proxy for that end person. And instead of saying, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, what do you say to your friends? I know somebody. Right? Not that that person needs to know somebody and that person needs to know somebody. That person needs to know somebody. I just know somebody. So proxy MAC is when your host puts the default gateway's MAC address in for the frame and passes it on to the router, not knowing that the router is that person or not. And what that router will do is check its routing table. And maybe it knows how to get to that destination device. Maybe it doesn't. So maybe it passes on to another router. Hence, that other router will act as a proxy for this router. I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Good about that? I can rule out D because the source MAC address doesn't stay the same during transmission. So whether you guys knew that or not, you can use the process elimination to eliminate all those. Because the only thing that stays the same as packets are being transmitted is what address? The IP addresses. And why do the IP addresses stay the same? So the packet can make its way back, right? Why are MAC addresses changing all the time? Because we're going from <coughs> device to device, from local to local to local, right? That's why we call it local delivery. So B is the best choice. <coughs> what type of address is 215.192.177.160.27, right? Host address, invalid, broadcast, can we eliminate B? Yeah, because they all fit between 0 to 255, correct? So we're saying slash 27. Here's my subnet mask, zeros, oh, sorry, 1, 1, then all zeros afterwards. Now I got to see what 160 looks like, correct? What's that? Uh, broadcast is usually a odd number, you're correct. Very good. I like it. So now we're stuck between A and C. So we eliminate D because broadcast is an odd number and we have an even number here. I say hell. Let's just figure it out. We have a 1 here, a 0 here, a 1 there. That's 160, correct? Then I have all zeros afterwards. All zeros in the host part make up the network. Hence. So yeah, because remember, these are the subnet bits. So it'd be choice C. Yet again, back to that old binary stuff. How do you determine the default gateway for a host device? I like drawing pictures when it comes to this. First choice says nearest Ethernet switch interface on the same. So what they're saying is you have a PC connected to a switch. This interface is going to be the default gateway for the PC. Does the switch act like a gateway? No. So A is out of the question. B, nearest serial uh, router interface on the WAN of the router. So that means I must have a router, and that must be connected to another router using a serial. And they're asking me, is that interface going to be the gateway for this PC? No. Nearest Ethernet interface on the next hop router. Here's the next hop router. Here's that interface. 
is that Ethernet interface going to be the gateway for this PC? Hence, the nearest Ethernet interface router on the same subnet as the host. So D seems to be logical. What range of dynamically assigned port addresses are used by the client apps? I don't like this answer. I'm going to tell you it is B, but there is a better answer. And so what I'm going to ask you guys is what are the three categories when it comes to port addresses? I'll start you off. It starts with zero. What's the end of the next range? So, or the beginning of the next range? So the first range, which we call the well-known ports, go from 0 to 1023. Next range goes from 1024 to 49,151. What do we call those? They are not dynamic like they want to tell you they are. We call them registered ports. And then 49,152 all the way up to 65,535 become your dynamic ports. Technically, this question is sort of right because you're allowed to sign anything after 1024 as being dynamic. But we are trying to move to that three model, three categories. <laughs> so B is the answer they want you to pick. There is a better one. Make sure you guys do know your well-known, your dynamic, and your registers, or well-known registers and dynamic. Oh, Evan, you answered this question the last time. What does the command copy TFTP running config do? So it takes a backup file and puts it into the running memory. So copies from TFTP to RAM. So choice A. Very good. How many broadcast domains are created by a switch? I can ask this question four different ways. Let's do this one. How many broadcast domains are created by a switch? What is another name for a broadcast domain? A network. How many networks does a switch create? Which doesn't create networks, right? Routers do, correct? So it's going to say uh, one by default since all ports are part of the same network. All right. What if I say this? How many broadcast domains are created by a hub? That's variation number two. Same answer. Because hubs and switches aren't breaking networks up, right? What if I say, how many collision domains? This is variation number three. How many collision domains are created by switches? One per port. Very good. What if I say, how many hub? Oh, sorry, how many bra How many collision domains are created by hubs? It's one giant collision domain. Yep. The more collision domains you have, the less chances you're going to have collisions. Ironically, okay. Which is correct regarding a 568 cable, 568A. Pin 1 and 2, what colors are they? Blue, orange, green, or brown? Green. Green. B is what? Orange. Which of the following can you not use a straight through cable for? PC to a switch, straight through a crossover. When you guys connect a PC to a switch, what type of cable? Straight through. Router Ethernet to a switch, what type of cable? Connecting dissimilar devices? Straight through. Router console to PC network interface card. <laughs> yeah, you use a console cable. Million dollar question. When using NAT, what type of address must be assigned to the interface closest to the ISP? So let's say this is the ISP. What type of IP address do I assign this interface? What does NAT stand for? Uh, close. Network address translation. What does that mean? Private to public. What side of this router is going to be dealing with private addresses? The one with the PC and the switch, right? 
This side is going to deal with public. If this is the public side. What type of address would you assign this side of the router? Public host. Why not a public network IP address? Very good. Going back to what we learned. Privates are eliminated. So we're stuck with A and C, and A is the best choice. All right, top 20 questions that students got wrong in the past from Cisco's finals. By the way, the questions have changed somewhat, but they're still pretty consistent. Question nine, some variations going to be dealing with this. Uh, what three characteristics of CSMA slash CD? Choose three of them. Cisco are big fans when it comes to picking more than one answer, correct? Yeah. Let's see what can we rule out. It uses a token system to avoid collisions. Yeah, CSMA does not avoid collisions, right? Data is transmitted only when the data signal is present. It's actually the opposite, right? If the data signal is present, it's going to shut up and wait its turn. So if we eliminate that. Now I got four, and I got to pick three out of the four. So now I get the question 75% uh, correct. Devices can be configured with a higher transmission priority. Does CSMA care about that? What service does care about that when it comes to prioritization? Quality of service, QoS. So we eliminate those, and now we're left with the top three, A, B, and C. Let's check, see if A is correct. It monitors the media for the presence of a data signal. Yeah, so we just got something saying down here. After detecting a collision, host can resume transmission after a random timer has expired. Uh, a, jam signals used to ensure that all hosts are aware that a collision has occurred. Yeah, you're going to make sure that everybody's up on page so that after you set the jamming signal, you set what we call the random timer, the jitter timer, so that devices can then go back without recreating a collision. So A, B, and C are the three options that I would pick. Refer to the exhibit. The host was disconnected from switch 2. That was over here, brought over to switch 1. Uh, which combination of IP address, subnet mask, and default gateway should be assigned to the host to allow a fully functional network? So here you are, given this information. OK, so which one? E. e? We can eliminate E because it's completely out of there. Uh, the way you eliminate E is he said 196. What should the default gateway be? What's that? 10.10.9.35, uh, .10 correct? Because we're here. And remember, it's always the f closest Ethernet side, correct? Here we are. Unfortunately, that only eliminates E. But I'm still stuck with F, D, C, B, and A. Any other ones I can eliminate? Yep. So let's look at it. We have a slash 27. A slash 27 is dot 224, correct? 128 plus 64 plus 32. So now I eliminated A, C, and E. So I'm stuck with B, C, or F, correct? What else can I do? No, wait a minute. B, D, and F. Well, B and E have a dot 37 for the IP address, but F has a dot 63. Well, remember the subnet mask. We have three ones and all zeros, correct? What's a 63? Whoops. You have all ones, right? What's all ones in the host part? So. F is out of the question. Now we're with B and D. Sorry. B and E. No, we really, yeah, we're with B and D. Mm -hmm. So we got 37 and 32. Well, let's take a look what 32 looks like. Ah, you're making an assumption that every time a router is always configured the last usable. In this case, it's not. Uh -huh. Take a look at what 32 represents. When I took my CCNA exam for this course, 
I didn't even bother going through that process of elimination that you guys are going through. First thing I did is threw it right into binary. All the time. I mean, 90% of the damn exam is some kind of binary variation, right? I eliminate through these. I realized that 32 is a network address, 63 is a broadcast address. Then I went and eliminated the subnet masks, and then I went through the process of looking at the default gateways. So this answer should be what? B, 37, because it's the only host address. Look at it through binary, guys. Which two factors can be determined by looking at this topology? Four collision domains. Are they being presented in this logic topology? Five. How many collision domains are represented by a switch? One per port. One, two, three. Correct? How many collision domains are represented by a hub? One. One, two, three, four. So A is a good one. One logical network is represented. Is that true? No. Got one network here and I got one network there, correct? Uh, two broadcast domains are represented. We said another name for a broadcast is a network. We have two networks. Those are my two. Uh, three networks are needed. No, because all I have is two. Uh, three logical address ranges are required. No, once again, all I have is two. So collision domains and broadcast domains. I don't know why my students in the past have gotten this question wrong. They issued the show running configuration command to show you what's active on the router. And you see that the interface FA0 slash 0, or the fast Ethernet 0 slash 0, has an IP address of 10.1.192.1, with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. The question then asks, a user wants to access the internet from PCA. Part of the running configuration of the router is shown. What default gateway IP address should be configured? They always want to give it 10.1.192.254. When is the only time you give a switch an IP address? For, um, yeah, management purposes. Switch doesn't handle routing traffic. So it should be 10.1.192.1. So A should be the only choice. Some of them would have answered the serial connector, but as you guys found out in the other questions, it's this side of the router, correct? Examine the graphic. Which current configuration host? So, what uh, with the current configuration, host A in the clerical office failed and was replaced. Although a ping to the loopback was successful, the replacement computer cannot access the company's network. So, we replaced A with a new computer. Here is the new configuration for A. With proxy ARP disabled on FA0/0 of the router, uh, what is the likely cause of the problem? of that mask because this is slash 26 and the rest of them are slash 27, correct? More importantly, it's a slash 27 up there as well. By the way, could you even know if the network failed, network card failed? Is there any way, any information provided to rule that out? Ping yourself, exactly. Could you determine that the cables were unplugged? You got to ping yourself again. So yeah, either you're there. So you can't make those assumptions. So make sure when you guys answer those, you look at it with what was given to you. In front of the exhibit, host A sends a frame to host C with a destination MAC address CC. The MAC address for host C is not in the MAC table of the switch. How will switch one handle the frame? Translation, frame comes into switch one, checks its MAC table. Says CC is not in there. What's the next step? Let's see. Switch one will drop the frame. Yes or no? Not sure. We'll come back to that one. B. Switch one will forward the frame to host C. Why not? So I can't forward it. Very good. Uh, switch one will flood the frames out of all ports. Can we rule that one out? Yeah. Yeah. We call that going hub. <laughs> <laughs> Why can we uh, eliminate that? The only time a switch sends out everybody is a broadcast signal. Okay, that's good. 
So that doesn't rule out this part, though. It forwards out of all the ports except the one the packet came in on, or the frame came in on. Is that all right? Even when it's going to do a broadcast, or even when the packet was a broadcast packet, it's not going to send it back to the person who just got done sending it to it, right? That'd be stupid. It's like me talking to you guys and I was talking to myself at the same time. Well, Nick, what do you think the answer is? <laughs> All right, so C is eliminated and B is eliminated. Now we're stuck with A and D. I like D because it handles what we just got talking <laughs> about, but why would you guys want to say that the frame is dropped? And this is where I want to argue with you. When did we learn about frames be being dropped? That's a packet. And you can't find a route. Once again, that's a packet. Packets are dropped. Frames don't want, I mean, switches don't want to drop frames. The only time a switch will ever drop it is when it first receives a frame and it cannot find its MAC address. Then it does a broadcast, it does an ARP request, sending out all the other ports except the one it came in on and asks, is there anybody who has this MAC address? If there is nobody on that network with that MAC address, then it'll drop it. But it first has to flood all the other ports except the one that it came in on to see if there's anybody out there that just turned on their computer with that MAC address before it can discard. Okay? No different than a router discarding a packet. Before it can discard, it's got to check its routing table, correct? So I choose the last one. And by the way, switch two would then say, I know about that MAC address because I'm going to act as a proxy to that device. So then switch one will pass it to switch two. Switch two would look at its physical table and say, oh, yeah, that's FA0 slash 10. Uh, user types in the enable command. Which task can be performed at this? Can you configure a device from the privilege exec mode? Can you configure individual interfaces from this mode? Can you configure terminal lines from this mode? Hence, show and debug. Remember, I was always telling you guys, hold the control key at the letter Z, type in show IP interface brief, or show IP route, or ping, or trace route, or anything of the nature. So D is the choice. Oh, I believe this is the fifth time we saw this question. But. It's on here because I got it wrong on my final exam. And I got it wrong because just like I did poorly on my SATs, I don't tend to read things clearly. So I will read it out to you guys. Look at the picture. A network t uh, technician has made several changes to R1 since the configuration has last been saved. Where are these configurations being stored at right now? Running. Running. Very good. The modified configuration did not produce desired changes. Hence the running configuration he's not happy with. The technician wants to store a backup copy of the saved configuration on a TFTP server before reloading it. Which action will cause the unmodified data to be saved on the TFTP server? B. B. And I have to pat you on the back. I just, for some reason, did not put the un and unmodified because throughout the whole damn question, it's the modified, the modified, the modified. And the last part of the question, thank you for making this a reading course, Cisco, which action will cause the unmodified data? So right off the bat, you can eliminate A and C because they're dealing with running config. Now how do we eliminate D? Because the next part is about the IP address and 3.254 is R1 and it needs to go to the TFTP server. So do a better job in reading than I will and the answer is B because it says unmodified. I think this is the last question. Refer to the exhibit at which OSI layer is a serial interface 0 slash 0 slash 1 experiencing problems. It says show interface 0 slash 0 slash 1. Uh, it says the serial 1 is up. So somebody turned it on. But line protocol is down. 
layer one. So that's what I thought. Well, it's I think it's in layer two because it's the same thing. Uh, never mind. No, why would you say layer two? Well, because it's up, so it's like on and running, but it's protocol. And, uh, so remember, we have up and up, two. right? So it's turned on, so that means the physical interface is working. Layer one's physical. Layer two is about the protocols. And it says line protocol is down. So we're talking about like CSMA or point to point or something to the effect, correct? What about layer three? Can we rule out layer three? So, so far, I like layer two. Why can't I rule out layer three? Does a serial connection need a layer 3 IP address? Uh, no, it's point to point. Point to point. What about layer 4? Where is layer 4 used at? Notice you're in the router. Router doesn't care about transport layer stuff. This is port addresses. If it was a firewall, maybe. <coughs> but who cares about port addresses? The end devices, right? Now, what I mean by port addresses, I'm not talking about the ports, the physical ports. Ironically, that's port named. But I'm talking about the end devices because the port addresses identify the service that's going to fulfill the request and the client's application that makes the request, right? So be careful. You can eliminate almost every choice by the information they gave you. Layer 1's eliminated because it is up. That means they turned it on. So the interface is OK. Layer 3 can be eliminated because it's a serial connection. You really don't need a layer 3 address. Layer 4 can be eliminated because routers don't handle that unless it has firewalls turned on. Ah, question 50. By the way, your final exam is all multiple choice and it is 50 questions. What do we have here? A network administrator is troubleshooting a link that is down between R1 and R2. Uh, what type of cable should be connecting R1 and R2? What type of cable should be connecting R1 and R2 through fast Ethernet? <laughs> you can see FA0 slash 0 and FA0 slash 1. But why not just use a serial cable? That's mm -hmm. really guys. Uh, better bandwidth, maybe? Yeah, maybe. To, connect, uh, sorry, to correct the problem, which wire pairs need to be switched on one of the Ethernet cables? So it should be a crossover cable. And which ones do we need to switch? What's that? Well, let's look at. Pin one and or sorry, pair one and pair two. Pair one is this blue stuff. Does the blue need to change at all? So you eliminate anything with pair one in it. Okay? So now we eliminate A and B. What about C? Pair two. Ooh. What have we learned when you guys are checking for crossover cables? If it's green white on one side and orange white on the other side for the pin one, then it's gonna be a crossover, assuming everything else is the same. I mean correctly wired. So I like pair two and pair three. I should be switching the green stuff with the orange stuff, right? What about D, pair two and pair four? Did the brown ever change? No. Nah, we didn't care about the brown. So pair uh, what, two and three? So I would definitely choose C. On your exam, it might ask you what is the pin configuration for crossover. So just make sure you guys know. Uh, one, two, three, what, six? Any questions? Wednesday, 8 o'clock for your class. If you're watching at home, your exam is Monday, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. So bring dinner. <laughs> Monday, that is what, December 10th? And you guys are December 12th. Any other questions? I got three minutes, two minutes. What is the blue and brown wire to? Because I have Ethernet cables at the house that don't even have those. Nope, you don't need them. Uh, they, uh, they're just there for future use. The other thing that could be used for absorbing interference. Uh, some are using to put power over Ethernet. So if you have a device that can be powered up by like a camera or whatever through Ethernet, then you can use those pins to send electricity.
Anything else, guys? Everybody's good? Tomorrow, your final lab. No, we're going to do that tomorrow in class. <laughs>